Good morning, everyone. Good to see you again. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I love being here. Um, excited to be here. It's, it's, a, it's a special thing to be part of a, um, a church family. You know, and I didn't realize that when I first became a Christian until I really started going to a church. And it's just, it's so cool because you have such a completely diverse group of people with all different stories united together by the single greatest story ever told. Yeah. Amen. And it's so cool the way a church can come together and collectively focus their love and their prayers around the mission of God. You see, it's world changing. And if someone doesn't believe that, you know, I, I want to know why are we still talking about Jesus 2,000 years later? Yeah. You know, see, Jesus changed the world and he started in a small room with a small group of people just like us right now. So never forget whether there's 10 of us or 10,000 of us, our strength will always be in the name of of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Last week we learned about Adam and Eve, and we know that the strength of man has and will fail. But when we put all of our hope, all our faith, all our trust in the name of Jesus, we will have victory. Mm -hmm. This is the center focus of our message this morning. And as we continue in our series entitled Battles, we're going to look at another Old Testament story. Fittingly, this time about a literal battle, a battle between the Israelites and a group of people known as the Amalekites. In this story, we're going to see God work an incredible miracle designed to ensure victory for the Israelites. But also, this story can teach us even more truth about how God is involved in our battles today. So we're going to get started with a brief history lesson uh, to help us understand why this battle even took place. So the Amalekites are actually a major player in the story of the Old Testament. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau, who was the brother of Jacob, the sons of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. So these two guys are brothers, right? And there's a king, King Amalek, hated the Hebrews for what had happened generations ago when Jacob stole Esau's blessing and his inheritance. You see, they're almost like two rival gangs, except that they, they started out as, as, as brothers. They're, they're, they're both they're descended from Jacob and Esau, and they were brothers. And after generations and generations, hearing the story, hearing the story of how Jacob's people, his, his kin, his children benefited from the blessing and prospered, Esau's people didn't. They began, the, all the Amalekites began to hate the, the Hebrews and the Israelites, and so... King Amalek led a vicious surprise attack on the vulnerable Hebrews traveling through the wilderness. You see, this attack wasn't like a, uh, like a normal uh, military move. The Amalekites snuck up from behind and attacked the rear. Now, for obvious reasons, in our time, we would call that cowardice. You know, we tend to look down on people who sneak up and attack from behind. But it gets worse. The reason they attacked from behind is because at the rear of the Hebrew group, would have been women and children and elderly people who couldn't keep up with the main pack of the group. Women, children, and elderly, these would have been the people straggling. These are the ones that a violent army decided to attack first. And from this first battle, we're going to study this morning, come, will come countless more battles that will be fought between these two groups. You see, the Amalekites would join with uh, the Moabites the Canaanites, the Midianites, really anyone who wanted a reason to fight against the Israelites, the Amalekites were like, yo, tag me in, I'm in, I want, I want to be a part of that. We hate these guys. If you ever heard the story of Esther, there's this evil man named Haman. He was actually a descendant of one of the Amalekite kings. In the story of Esther, this Haman, he works for a king, and he tries to trick him into committing genocide against all of the Jews. It's a crazy thing. Keep all this in mind as we discuss this battle today, this morning, at Rephidim. So here we go. Exodus 17. We're going to look at verses 8 through 16. So we'll be in Exodus chapter 17, and we're starting in verse 8. You can also read the slide behind me as well. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. Excuse me. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. 
while Aaron and her held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. All right, so it's a bit of a crazy story. And the first time I read this, I had a lot of questions. You know, and even now I still have some questions. You know, namely, where can I get a staff like that? Like, man, if I could take a staff like that with me in my daughter's soccer games, it'd be like, bam, goal. Bam, another goal. Like, I want to decimate these six-year-old teams, like, biblically. You know? I am so down for that. But... Try to imagine yourself as one of these Hebrews. You've just escaped years and years of slavery in Egypt, only to be attacked by some shameless group of people who come up from behind and attack the most vulnerable people in your group. The last thing on your mind is probably the goodness of God. In fact, at this point, the Hebrews have already doubted God on several occasions, even though they saw him bring the plagues to Egypt and part the Red Sea. Wasn't that just like us, though? I mean, how many of us have had one of those amazing, feels like a life-transforming God moment? Only to come off that hilltop and find yourself forgetting about God a week later. Our antidote to the trials of life that lead to doubting God is simple. And it's our first point this morning. Trust God's power. So in verse 8, the stage is set. The people of God have been attacked and they must respond. In verse 9, we see a unique response. Moses tasks Joshua with preparing an army to fight back. Now keep this in mind. These people have been slaves all of their life. None of them would have ever been allowed to possess their own weapons or armor. If anyone had a weapon, it was probably something they found or maybe tried to make on rocks and sticks along the way. There was also no formal military training or even like a draft like we have today. Joshua was looking for untrained unarmed volunteers. These individuals would have had to rely on the power of God if they ever thought they were going to succeed. And it's kind of a unique irony that this is one of the patterns of God. I bet you can see in your own life, you come across some seemingly insurmountable challenge or you come, uh, or an adversary or maybe a trial in your life. Maybe, or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe you're trying to get a dream job or take advantage of a huge opportunity in your life. And on either side of the spectrum, you find yourself feeling unqualified. Maybe you're even a little unprepared. And it's easy to feel fear or doubt. We might even say to God, why does it have to be this way? And when we do that, we totally miss out on what God is wanting to do. You see, God uses our weaknesses to show us his strength. Be encouraged when Paul says, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I mean, church, do you see that? Like, like how backwards is that? (laughs) Personally, I love it. Our weaknesses invite the power of God into our lives. When we can't rely on ourselves, nothing is in the way of trusting God instead. Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. But why? You see, because when you you got all the money in the world, why would you ever think that you need Jesus' help? When we think that we have all the comfort, we forget our need for the comforter. This volunteer army would surely have thought about the power of God and had confidence in that to help them win. And on this day, they trusted it enough to bet their lives on it. And so as the story goes, Moses holds up the staff, and as long as it's held high above his head, the Hebrew army is winning the battle. But look at the end of verse 12. Right here in the text we read, So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. So what did God's power do? What was God's response 
to the volunteer force who took up arms against their enemy and put their trust in him? It took them a single day to win. A single day. Like, how many wars and battles have we fought that have lasted years or decades even? In fact, America only just removed our soldiers from Afghanistan after, I think, like 20 years? Yeah. And I'm not a military genius, but even that seems like maybe we did it too soon. The power of God needed just a single day. Like, come on, church. Like, who doesn't want that kind of breakthrough in their life? That's the kind of victory I want when I'm praying for my children. That's the kind of victory I want when I'm, when I'm praying for this church. We've got to be willing to trust in God's power. Amen. And you know what? We've got to be real, too. No way all of those guys were 100% certain that they were going to win. We already know that many of them had what we might call today weak faith. But this is good news for us because we can relate on a similar level. Imagine you're standing on a cliff and you begin to fall. You know, beside you is a, is a, is a branch. It's your only hope for survival. So how does the branch save you? You could know in your head all of the facts about the branch. You can see it's big, it's strong, it's sturdy, it's well, it's definitely strong enough to hold you. You could know it, trust it, believe it. But unless you actually reach out and grab it, you're done for. If instead your mind is filled with maybe some doubts or some uncertainty that the branch could actually hold you, but you reach out and grab it anyway, you will be saved. I love this quote from Pastor Tim Keller. It is not the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith that actually saves you. Strong faith in a weak branch is fatally inferior to a weak faith in a strong branch. You see, guys, it's not how much faith you have in, let's say, yourself, or how much faith you have in, in any particular God. It's who you put your faith in. You can have all the faith in, your, in the world and your own abilities to accomplish something, but you can have the faith the size of a mustard seed in God and move mountains. Amen. Because it's not about the size of your faith. It's who are you putting your faith in. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've heard people say to me so many times, you know, I'm not ready to trust God because, and they, they list a whole bunch of things they're not 100% sure about. And I just wish they could recognize they don't have to know everything about God to reach out and trust him. Friends, God wants to challenge and grow us. And the way we learn to trust him more tomorrow than we do today is to trust him more today than we trusted him yesterday. That's going to require risk and surrender. But for God to allow us to trust in anything else would be entirely unloving of him. Trust is one of those things that it's easier said than done, though. It's one of my most consistent prayers to God that I would trust his faithfulness. I want to believe that if God tells me to step out onto water, he's got this whole uh, gravity thing figured out, you know what I'm saying? And so God has another way of helping us to trust in his power. He uses other Christians to challenge us, teach and lead us. And even in some cases, he uses other people to literally hold up our arms for us. Our next point this morning is trust God's people. God will use certain people in your life at certain times to help you. Through God's power, we can trust that he will rescue and save us. But he does this in a variety of different ways. One of which is God will use other people to support you. In our text, we see one of the coolest images as we read in verse 11. Moses is on top of the hill. He's overlooking the battle. And as he gets tired, Aaron and her, they get a large stone for Moses to sit on. When his arms grow weary, they step in to literally hold his arms high. When he can no longer do so on his own. In Galatians, Paul writes that we are to bear one another's burdens. And what better way to lift the weight of Moses' burden than to literally lift his arms? There's a couple big observations we need to emphasize here. The first one is that God decided that his power and presence would be in effect only when Moses held the staff above his head. But I have to wonder why. Why require something from Moses that he would be physically incapable of doing forever? See, God isn't surprised by Moses' physical limitations. In fact, he's counting on it. By challenging Moses to do something he cannot do on his own, it draws him into further reliance upon God to help him. In this case, 
God doesn't give Moses super strength to hold it all on his own. He gives him two friends who desire to bear the weight and hold his arms for him. Church, we must release ourselves from the pressure of thinking that we have to do everything on our own. In some cases, you might even be going against God's desire for you. Imagine how the story plays out if Moses pridefully rejects Aaron and hers help. Like, no, no, I got this. I can do it. I don't need you. His arms are shaking. He's sweating. He keeps dropping his arms lower and lower. The Hebrews could have been destroyed because of Moses' desire to do it all on my own. And man, that truth speaks to me so much. Like, I often try to not ask for help. And not just like in the guy way, like when I'm driving. Like, like I actually respect people who are able to get things done all on their own. And like, and that's, that's weird to some degree. And I even avoid asking for help as much as I can. I think I just want to prove to people that I can do things all on my own, which is actually kind of foolish. Uh, a couple nights ago, I was sitting in my basement just feeling really overwhelmed. I'm looking at the walls. You see, I'm trying to finish out my basement. I want to build walls and a floor and all this stuff, make it look nice. And uh, I have zero experience. <laughs> I, know, I bought like a nail gun and a whole bunch of wood and I got like YouTube opened up, but I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and honestly, like I, like I need some help. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> <laughs> you want to come help me frame it? That'd be great. But if I just keep sitting there trying to do it on my own, I'm never going to finish. Right. Let God use people in your life to support you and accomplish great things. I love this saying. It goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together Amen. the second thing that we need to be the second thing is we need to be people willing to bear each other's burdens mm -hmm. it's great that Moses accepted their help but he they had to offer it first Jesus said the world will know we are his disciples by our love for one another when we bear each other's burdens it's one of the most loving things we can do and it's always going to be inconvenient it's a burden. I mean, you've probably already got a bunch of your own burdens you need help with. So imagine what it would be like to voluntarily ask for more. And the thing about these is when you solve them, it doesn't make your life easier. It's for someone else. <laughs> yeah. God wants us to trust each other, to love each other. And so he calls us to serve one another. When Jesus washed his disciples' feet in a humbling act of service, he said the following. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. You know, this past Friday, I was driving home, and uh, I saw this man holding a sign on the side of the road. I'd seen him twice this week already. Same, same, same side, same road. Today was the third time I saw him. And the thing that, that caught my eye the most was that he was always barefoot. Um, I don't know if he was homeless or if he was just going through some kind of crisis that led him to beg for help. But on this third time, it was a red light. And so I had some time I could actually talk to him. So I lowered my window and I asked him, how are you doing? And uh, he was like, oh my, oh, okay. And I was like, hey, what's your shoe size? You know, we spoke for a few more seconds before the light turned green. He told me he had a job interview at FedEx coming up and he was really just hoping to get some clothes so we could <laughs> do well the job interview. And I told him about this place that I work at in Castle Rock, how they can help him with clothing and food and even more resources that he might need. And then the light turned green, and, and he was trying to yell his contact information to me. He had, he had like an email address, and I'm, I felt bad because I'm flying on his car. I was like, okay, okay, I got it. And I make the left turn, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking out my phone. I shouldn't be texting and driving, but I'm like, I, I don't want to forget his email. And then I'm like, how do you spell Frederick? And um, I was trying to guess it, and then all of a sudden, in an instant, it occurred to me, I don't have to do this. Why send an email? Why wait? Literally, he's right back behind me, and there's like a target down the road. I can go in right now, get him some shoes, and get back there before he, before he goes or wherever he's going. So I had this, uh, this group chat with a bunch of the students who used to be in my youth group. They're all teenage kids. I told them about Frederick, and I invited them to help me get him some shoes if they wanted to. And so I just said, hey, guys, if, uh, I'm going to go buy this guy some shoes, and if y'all want to help send him some money or something, you, you can totally be a part of this. This is a cool thing that I know God's working in. In less than five minutes, these there's maybe like 15 of them on this, on this little group chat. These teenagers collectively donated $60. Wow. They all just sent it to me really quick like on Venmo to help a stranger that they didn't even know. I was able to buy him new shoes, socks, and a couple gift cards. So I drive back to where Frederick was, and he's like, he's like in a, a really difficult spot to get to. So I have to go around over here to some other parking lot. I walk up this big grassy hill thing, and I'm still wearing like work clothes, and so I look all like 
and see and stuff. And there's all these people in their, in their cars, and I'm coming up the side of this like grass thing. Like, stop me! I got a target bag, and I'm like, I just feel a little bit embarrassed, even. Aww. And um, and it's, it's funny, you know. I, I walk across the little highway. I get to him, and I show him the shoes and the socks, and I'm like, Hey, we got you a gift card for you know like Subway, and I got you a gift card at Target, so you can go buy your own clothes. You know, you know, I, I don't know what size you wear. And uh, he was so grateful. And uh, we spoke for a while. He told me how he moved here from Mississippi with his three-year-old daughter. He told me about the interview he had the next day. And uh, it turns out I actually did misspell his email. He fixed it for me. And the next day he sent me this email. So see that picture. You can't quite see it, but the topic says orientation reminder. And then the part he highlighted says, you have orientation tomorrow, Saturday, September 25th at one o'clock PM. This is your first day of work. Amen. Guys, he got the job. Yes. His first day of work was yesterday. God wants to use his people to help others, which means we got to be willing to do some inconvenient and often uncomfortable things. In my case, it really, it really, really wasn't that hard. Like, all in all, we spent about 90 bucks to get him some socks, shoes, all those gift cards. I mean, I felt a little embarrassed walking through, but I mean, I, it's, those are small things. Like, like, Frederick has a job and a real shot to be able to provide for his daughter. People are fighting real battles every day, everywhere, and God wants to use us, all of us, as messengers distributing his power and love to each of them. Consider the story of Paul, this, this great missionary guy who wrote almost all the New Testament, and a man named Ananias in Acts chapter 9. You see this, the, the verses right behind me. For three days, Paul was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there is a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he, <coughs> excuse me, whew, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. So then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Mm. Ananias had to be willing to go serve a man who had court orders to kill him and anyone else like him who followed Jesus. He could have said no, but instead he said, yes, Lord, or here I am, God. Not everyone can be like Paul. I get that. You know, we can't all just be this great missionary all over the world. But here's the thing. Anyone can be like Ananias and say, yes, Lord, and go serve another person. Our last point this morning, trust God's purpose. See, Ananias is probably like, God, I'm not really sure what you're doing here. Why would you choose this guy who's been killing your people? I don't, that doesn't quite click here. <laughs> Trust God's purpose. You can, you can say, God, I disagree with you and still be obedient. You can say, God, I'm not sure what you're doing, but I'm still going to go do it. You, you can do those simultaneously. You don't have to wait for the right feelings to do the right actions. God is right. He's worthy of your trust. Trust his power, trust his people, and trust God's purpose. You see, God wants us to trust that he can rescue and save us. He does this through his power and through other people in our lives. And we know this is possible because God's power and God's presence establishes God's purpose. We're promised in Romans 8, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We can trust in God's purpose even when all the circumstances around us try to give us evidence to the contrary. 
when Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a furnace for not bowing to a statue of a king. They were unburned. And it's said that there was a fourth person with the appearance of the son of the gods was seen in the fire with them. When Daniel was thrown into a den of lions because he wouldn't stop praying to God, an angel appeared to shut the mouths of the lions. When Peter, who walked on water, became scared and began to sink, it was Jesus who was present with him with his outstretched hand that pulled him out and saved him. Friends, in all these stories, the power and presence of God is what saved his people. That was his purpose. For the Hebrews, the staff of Moses symbolized this. But today, we don't need a staff. We have the Holy Spirit. Yes. Jesus said, it's better for me to leave so, and then to stay so the helper will come. The Holy Spirit is the helper and he lives in you. Amen. No longer does the church need to carry around a giant tent called the tabernacle to house and keep the presence of God. If you are a follower of Jesus... Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He resides in you. All the power and all the presence of God right there in his Holy Spirit. Every great miracle, every wonderful moment, you have access to that power within you right now. A power that saves. A power that is victorious over evil. A power and a presence of God that gives us the confidence to face every burden of this life and cry out to God, yes, Lord. I want you to listen to this story from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. There's a great king. He's one of my favorite guys in all the Chronicles. His name is Jehoshaphat. It's an awesome name. When he received news that two major armies, the Moabites and the Ammonites, had joined forces to attack the Israelites, he prayed to God for help. And in the story, the text says that the word of God spoke through a young man. Here we go. And he said, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. I love that God's like, just so you know, here's what's all about to happen. Like, if you're nervous, I'm already telling you how it's going to go down. <laughs> you will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. Amen. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them. And the Lord will be with you. Mm. Now you. You probably have a lot of things going on in your life, I'm, I'm sure. Mm. The battle is not yours, but God's. Amen, yes. Look at verse 15 in our story. The last one right there. Moses declares, the Lord is my banner. He is giving the glory to God. The Lord is the one that we rally behind. The giant sign, the giant, actually, literally meant giant banner pole. We'd hold up the pole and the military would take it and they'd see it and say, now it's time to advance. We can do it. The Lord is the one we rally behind. He's the one who inspires and makes victory possible. So do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Together, church, let's go out and face tomorrow and the Lord will be with us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for fighting and getting involved in these battles. Your word is encouragement to us. Your word is breath in our lungs. God, when we face these hardships, we face enemies who feel like they're coming against us on all sides, whether it be disease or circumstance or a job or a relative or something we're just not feeling great about, Lord, we can look to you and say, Lord, you got this. I love the quote from a pastor who said, I have learned to kiss the wave that crashes me upon the rock of ages. Mm -hmm. God, teach this to us. That in hardship, in hurt, in pain, it gives us reason to be embraced and run to you more than we would normally. God, the best day isn't a day where everything goes, go, doesn't go wrong. The best day is a day that we feel present and intimately close to you. Lord, let us hunger for that. 
Let us be excited and encouraged and emboldened that we can fight these battles because you go before us. God, give us the strength to stand strong. Even in these stories, the armies had to fight. They had to get ready. They had to get geared up. They couldn't just wait and sit back. God said, go up against them. Stand firm. Lord, teach us to stand firm so we can see your majesty. God, we thank you. And we praise you in advance for the victories to come. Lord, we trust your purpose, however you want to write that victory. It might not be the way that we think it's supposed to be. It might not look the way it's supposed to look. It might not make sense until we're in heaven with you, God. But we say right now, we declare factually, we will trust your purpose. God, call us to battle. We trust you. We want to fight for you. There are people who need you, are, you need you, and you called us to be your hands and feet. Lord, thank you for Frederick and the, the, the countless more men and women who have stories like him, who you are using us to minister to. And thank you, Jesus, for giving us the Holy Spirit. When you died, when you left, you gave us the greatest gift, an infinite presence and power of God that can go with us anywhere and everywhere. Let us be comforted by that. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother.